Good morning, everyone. I was invited to speak to my stepfather's chapter of the Veterans of Foreign Wars in Toledo, Ohio, several years ago. Men and women of the greatest generation. It was a privilege to address veterans who had defended their country against aggression in Europe and in the Pacific theater. Men and women who left behind the comfort and security of their homes for a higher purpose. I explained to them, as a Buddhist monk, that I came from a military family. My father flew 51 missions in B-24s over Europe and North Africa. My stepfather worked in the Signal Corps in Europe and served as General Eisenhower's Jeep driver on several occasions. My Uncle John was in the first wave of soldiers to enter Auschwitz concentration camp. He never spoke of what he saw there. My older brother Stephen was a career soldier who, after serving in the intelligence in Vietnam, went on to teach French at West Point worked for NATO in Paris and in Istanbul, and who moved into an office in the Pentagon below Colin Powell's office. He retired a lieutenant colonel. And yet here I stand before you a Buddhist monk. My mother could never figure that one out. In fact, the course of my life's study of Chinese language and my first exposure to Buddhism was set thanks to a Green Beret, a Special Forces officer, the late John C. Campbell of Toledo, Ohio, a devout Catholic his entire life. He served as a Special Forces officer in Taiwan, fell in love with the culture and the language of Chinese, and wanted to bring the cultures of the West and the East together. After returning to civilian life, he secured a federal grant to establish for high school students in Toledo, the Sino-Soviet Studies Center to learn Chinese and Russian languages and history while in high school. At the time, such a program was only one of three public schools in America to offer languages and cultures of Asia and Russia to high school students. I proudly received the first John C. Campbell Memorial Scholarship to continue my college studies in Mandarin Chinese in the memory of John C. Campbell, who tragically died in a plane crash in 1967. So it is my honor to share that story when the opportunity arises. So here we are in the Presidio Interfaith Chapel where so many men and women spoke to their gods before leaving to place their bodies in the path of danger for their country. And here we might do well to reflect upon the causes of warfare, surely one of humanity's most senseless activities. And I wanted to share with you a vision of Buddhists in China who looked beyond the winning side, the side that obviously had God on it, to a wish to end suffering, not just for the combatants and their families, but indeed for all beings. In their search for an end to suffering and sorrow, these Buddhist men and women in China traditionally saw all acts of killing as causes that in the future lead on to further acts of killing. Each killing plants a seed of hatred in that most powerful tool, the human mind. They saw those seeds of hatred in the human mind as having the power to set the wheel of karma, which simply means actions and their retribution, to set spinning that wheel of karma, including vengeance and retribution in the form of willingness in the mind to go to war against that enemy whom I perceive, someone who may have killed me 
in the past and I recognize them and now see them as enemy when the fruits of those seeds of hatred bring forth fruit. So through that lens, here in the chapel, it's an interesting reflection on the cause of warfare, suffering, and sorrow. The Buddha's wisdom would tell us that the mind is like a fertile garden, able to grow any seeds that we plant and nurture. As is the seed, so is the fruit. Plant carrots, you get rosy carrots. Plant nettles, you harvest stinging nettles. The mind contains wisdom and compassion, as evidenced today by our gathering. But the mind also contains greed, anger, and delusion. Which will we grow? A thought of fighting in the mind, if unchecked, can plant the seed of contention that can ripen into killing behavior. The mind also has a self-reflective function. We can review the thoughts that arise with the teachings of our higher nature so abundant in every religion. The golden rule, for example, being one of them. If I do not want my house destroyed, my family torn apart, my son sent away to die, my daughter to know terror, then I can resolutely refuse to allow warlike thoughts to grow in the garden of my mind when I am told by whatever authority that it is right to inflict those horrors that I don't want on other fellow humans. With this power of self-reflection, I can vow to disarm the weapons in my mind. If I extend that vision further, as these ancients would suggest it's fruitful to do, if I seek to create an entire world free of suffering, then the Buddha's wisdom gently reminds us that the universe is indeed not anthropocentric, humans in the middle. Humans are but one of many species with whom we share our planet. Humanity's belief, humanity's brief run on planet Earth has surely been the most destructive of other life, other species. Wars destroy all in their path indiscriminately. So on Veterans Day, we do well to recall the suffering inflicted through warfare on the voiceless multitudes. Indeed, ancient wisdom has held for centuries that even the biosphere feels the impact of human warfare. There is a wisdom saying celebrated in many cultures that nothing on a battlefield will flourish for seven years after the last shot is fired. So if we want to investigate the root causes of warfare and its oceans of tears and its mountains of bones and swelling chorus of laments and wails, according to ancient wisdom, we need to look beyond the war room, the pentagons, the defense budgets, the collateral damages. We need to listen to the causes of suffering, which are thoughts of fighting in my mind that when unchecked can lead to acts of killing. So the greatest generation fought in Europe and in Asia to protect the world from tyranny and aggression. Had they not been willing to sacrifice everything, our lives would be very different today. But when the aggressors had been vanquished, the killing did not stop. Only the battlefield changed from the point of view of these ancient Chinese Buddhists. They said meat-eating is the new battlefield. Meat eating before World War II was limited to special days, to holidays, to weekends, birthdays, because meat was rare. After World War II, phosphate fertilizers created the Green Revolution and the ability for us to eat meat three times a day. Farms became factory farms, barnyards turned to feedlots, Butchers became produce sections in the supermarket. Acts of killing every day in our kitchens beget reactions of hatred and resentment, revenge and retribution. These ancient Chinese said, and I offer this for our reflection to see whether this holds true for you, those who kill will be killed in turn. The bitter stew of hatred 
boils on from one lifetime to the next. No sentient creature dies unwillingly from my plate, dies willingly for my plate. A wise Chan master whose name was Cloud of Vows from the Tang Dynasty, where warfare was certainly not unknown, left us this stark statement of the cause of warfare, terror, weapons, and their aftermath. For countless years, the bitter stew of hate goes boiling on. Its vengeful broth is ocean deep, impossible to calm. To learn the cause of all this hatred, terror, bombs, and war, hear the haunting midnight cries by the butcher's door. Its vengeful broth is ocean deep, impossible to call. To learn the cause of all this terror, sorrow, bombs, and war. Hear the haunting midnight cries by the butcher's door. But the earth itself will remind us as will our children, and the animals, and the forests, and the sky, and the rivers, that we are part of this earth, and it is part of us. All things are deeply connected, and so the choices we make in our daily lives have enormous influence, not only on our health and our vitality, but also on the lives of other beings, indeed on the destiny of life on earth. Thankfully, we have the cause to be grateful. What's best for us personally is also best for other forms of life and for the life support systems upon which we all depend. So today on this occasion of Veterans Day here at the Interfaith Chapel at the Presidio, when we recall with deep, lasting gratitude the service and defense of our freedom of our veterans, we offer our thanks and our wish for peace and security, for long life and blessings for all beings. May all become compassionate and wise. <laughs> 